So I want to start today with Psalm 148. Psalm 148. The Lord's word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all the stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all the hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, and his glory is above all earth and heaven. For he has lifted up a horn for his people. Praise all of his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Let everybody praise the Lord. The reading of the Lord's word. Lord God, thank you so much that you've made us people to praise. We, you've made us into a body that will praise you when many in the earth, many in the world, don't even know who you are or don't recognize you, don't give you the honor and glory that you deserve. But you brought us to that knowledge. You brought us here to praise you. And we love the fact that you invest in us, you care for us, you teach us, you give us opportunities to love one another in your name. We are so blessed by you, Lord, even to the point that we could lift up your name in praise. We come some weary, some wounded, some ill, some dealing with difficulties in life, but we can lay them all aside for just a glimpse moment and realize you are on the throne. You created everything that we see, everything that we have, and you know all about us, even from our intimate creation in the womb to every thought that we have. We can never go anywhere without you being with us. Your presence is around us forever. What a great joy it is, Lord, for us to be able to come praise you realizing all of the wonderful blessings of life come from you. Please take our praise this day, this hour, in this moment. Revel in the fact that your people love you and thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord's word today from 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, the first 10 verses. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of God our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You have also become imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. 
for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception that we had with you, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for providing that for us. We were talking about the ideal church. What should the church look like? How should the church react? How do you know if you've got a good church or a not so good church? You walk on the outside, you see a building, you see a lot of people coming in, you see a lot of people coming out after the service. How can you tell if it's a good church or if it's just some people hanging out and it's a social club? How do you really evaluate whether your church is doing what it should do or not? We have examples for us in the scriptures that we can look at other churches, we can see whether or not they were rebuked by a writer. For example, the church in Corinth needed a lot of help. <laughs> if you read 1 Corinthians, it's not a very positive letter to these guys. Yeah, there's some encouraging things in there, and we'll look at some of those earlier today, but as a whole, it's a letter of rebuke. Look, guys, straighten up, fly right. And then you look at, in Revelation, you have the Lord actually reviewing seven churches for us in chapter 2 and chapter 3. The Lord is quite clear. He says exactly what he doesn't like. He said exactly what he likes. He allows us to be able to get into his mind and see how he evaluates these churches. And in some cases, we have Paul writing to one of these churches, and then we have the Lord writing to one of these churches. And we can kind of compare because they're at different times, different timelines of perspective. This church in Thessalonica is an interesting church because they were very, very young. It was a brand new plant. On the second missionary journey, Paul goes to Thessalonica and plants this church by doing what he normally does. He went in preached in the synagogue, preached Jesus as the Messiah, drew a lot of people to him who believed that were Jews. And they started following him and listening to him a lot more. After a while, the rest of the people who liked the way it was got a little upset with Paul, ran him out of town. How dare you sheep steal? How dare you take people away from our synagogue fellowship, our ritualistic religion? And talk about this Messiah guy, this, this guy that got killed, you know. And so they ran him out of town. Paul goes down the road to this place called Berea. He does the same thing. He goes in there. He preaches in the synagogue. The Bereans were really interesting people because they focused on what Paul said. And they weren't just going to take it at face value. They were going to prove it to themselves. They were going to find out themselves. And so the Berean people in the church were looking at the scriptures, trying to understand what Paul said and make sure that it was true. That's why the name the Berean church or Berean believers has such a good following, because they were that way about that. But the, the synagogue in Thessalonica didn't like the fact that he was doing the same thing down the road in Berea got a posse together, went down, ran him out, out of Berea. So now Paul is out of that place as well. Paul finds himself all the way down at the southern part of Achaia. And he's in Athens, Greece. And then he wants to find out what this young church is actually doing. How is this little church that I started, what are they really up to? And so he sends Silas or Silvanus and Timothy up to check out the church. Paul can't go to himself. He doesn't want to cause another uproar. So he sends his two 
faithful men from the missionary journeys to get a report of this. The answer back was very, very positive. The church was doing well. They were a powerful young church. They believed and they were growing in knowledge of the Lord. So this letter is Paul's answer back to this church after getting that positive report from them. Compared to the Corinthian church, this letter is overwhelmingly a positive report. That's why I call it the ideal church or the example church for us to follow. So we're going to look at why I think it's the ideal church today. So what about Thessalonica? Thessalonica was called a free city. It was a free city because even though Roman rule existed, the Romans allowed them to manage themselves. They allowed them to manage the government, run the systems. They had a lot of latitude. It's about 200,000 people or so are in the city at its height and its peak at this point. Commerce was, was very big in the area because there was a road called the Via Ignatia, the Ignatia Way or road that connected a lot of these cities together and it was a place of commerce where people would buy and sell things and had industry and stuff. So there was a lot of activity in this city. Lots of opportunity to see new people, to talk about new things. The Greek culture in general was one where they really liked to talk about stuff. They really liked to talk about ideas. Like if you came up with a new idea, you know, you'd have a lot of people wanting to hear because they loved to fill their heads with information that was new. Maybe you know somebody like that in your family. You know, every time they find out something new, they have to tell you, you know what I found out? You know what I learned today? And then they would expound for a long period of time about what they learned. This was the Greek culture at that point in time. So when Paul writes this note back to this little church, he's got a lot of positive, encouraging things to say about them. So you can see with the sermon notes, a pretty elaborate outline for you to fill in. Those of you guys who love to fill in sermon notes are going to have a field day with this today. Because um, I've got six things that I highlighted for the ideal church that come out of this passage. Six things, some of, some of which we've covered you know, a little bit before, but in most cases, new stuff that we saw the Thessalonian church do that was very, very good, and we want to replicate that and understand that. The first thing listed there, Paul's words to this, to the church in verse 2. He said, we give thanks always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers. The ideal church has a pastor that is focused on prayer. A pastor is focused on prayer. The church is focused on prayer, led by a pastor focused on prayer. Very important for the leader of the church to be pursuing God personally, to be intently taking his people before the Lord in prayer, praying for the health of the church, praying for the youth of the church, praying for the growth of the church, to be passionate about the people in the church. The pastor should love and care for the people of the church as a priority, not about his own position, his own health, wealth, prosperity, glory. He needs to be a man that is focused on the people that he intends to serve and that the Lord has called him to serve. Paul was that way. Paul was always that way. You can imagine how much time he had free time traveling around. The man was in prison very, very often, chained to a Roman guard for years on end. Can you imagine what this man's prayer life would be like? How he saw the Lord work in his life over periods of time and how that translates in the prayers for others. You have an experienced man who was not perfect, 
but he's definitely been through life lessons. Paul talks about how he was shipwrecked many times, without food many times, cold without clothing many times, you know, battered, bruised, beaten. He had this eye disease where he couldn't see, so he needed somebody to write for him. There was a time in his life where the Lord had sent what he called a thorn in his side, if you remember that. He wanted this to be removed, and the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. You're good. This is there for a reason, to keep you humble. He was a man of great intelligence, great intellect. He, he had the ability to communicate because he knew multiple languages. He was, he was easy, it would be easy for him to be high and lifted up and high and mighty. But yet the Lord shaped his life through life experiences to be a man of prayer, realizing that he needed to lay it all on the line for his fellowship because that was the man that the God wanted to lead all of the churches to the Gentiles. And so we need to have leaders who are focused on prayer. <clears throat> and the pastor should be the example for that. I don't know how you think we are here at Calvary Baptist Church on prayer. There are people who are prayer warriors in this church that I know bring my name before the Lord every day. And I really appreciate that. I try to do the same for all of you, praying for you guys by name. You know, Lord, care for them, heal them, help them, educate you know, them, fulfill them. Bring them to your view of perfection for them in your life and encourage them and use me to encourage them. So I pray that that's something that I continue to do and it's something that Kat and I continue to do as a couple as we minister. Paul was a great example for that. The second thing we notice here Verse 3, he says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God, our Father. A church where faith, hope, and love is paramount. A church where faith, hope, and love is paramount. Faith, hope, and love are very famous words that are put together. If you see faith, hope, and love, you probably think about 1 Corinthians 13, right? Love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecoming, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, it does not take into account wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away way with. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. The excellence of love chapter used in many weddings. Why does Paul write such great detail about love to the Corinthian church? Because they weren't doing it. And they needed a reminder. They needed a reminder. Why do you think that the greatest of faith, hope, and love is love? Why is love the greatest? Any ideas? People like to talk about love. It's pretty easy, really. Faith is not permanent. Faith will eventually go away. 
Paul says that in there. He says, now we look at a mirror dimly lit, but eventually we're going to see the Lord, what? Face to face. Faith isn't permanent. You're not going to need faith. What about hope? Hope we need while we're here. We have hope in the Lord's coming. We have the hope in our eventual salvation. We need to have hope here because we don't see it for ourselves. There's too many data points out in the future for us to live. Hope is temporary. Love is permanent. Love will start here and will carry on into the future. That's why it's the greatest, because it's the only one that lasts. It's the only one that will persist from here into the eternal, is love. And maybe you think to yourself, you know, I'm not very good at loving, you know, people. I'm a curmudgeon kind of person. You know, I make mistakes. I don't tell people I love them when I do. I don't communicate, you know, very well. Yeah, I'm talking to all the husbands right now. <laughs> maybe that's the way you view yourself. But in the perfect, you will be excellent at it. Your love will be persistent in that, and you will be a love superstar at that point. But the Corinthian church needed help. Corinthian church, not good at it. Their definition of love was what they could get for themselves. They were all thinking about just them and not <laughs> others. Why go through the Corinthian example? Because this church in Thessalonica was not that way. Paul lauds them. He says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. So the first sub-bullet there, the church works. An ideal church is a church that works. It's on a mission for Jesus in its community. It's doing something. It's not just hanging out on Sunday mornings or Wednesday night. It's in operation every day of the week, wherever you are. In your, in your office, in your school, in your home. The church is on the move and working. It's educating people. It's reaching out to people. It's caring for people. It's one of those organisms that really flourishes in an ideal church. When you know, man, these guys get it. They are in they are living it. They are doing it. In contrast to somebody that might just be words only. These guys are on the move. That's the ideal church. A church that works. The Apostle James wrote this in James 2, 14 to 17. What use is it, my brethren, if somebody says he has faith and has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother and sister is without clothing in need of daily food and one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you don't give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. If somebody you know has been in church their whole life, and is caring only for themselves and is not doing anything for that. James would say, you got to wonder if those, those guys are really in. Because you should see the Lord working through your life to help others, to care for others, to minister for others. Some great examples in my past with churches that were on the move in this area. They loved so well and they did that because they were a working church. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Man, this is a powerful section. We're going to hit this on Wednesday night. That's our Bible study. Is Wednesday night is on Ephesians, and we're going to look at Ephesians 2 soon. But so many good things in this. 
Yeah, we want to have works along with our faith, but that doesn't mean we're saved by the works. You can't work yourself into heaven. It just doesn't work that way. Heaven is a gift. It is a gift, Paul tells the Ephesians for that. But this last line, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. That is a beautiful word in the original language. The word is poema. It's where we get the word poem from. Think about this. God has created a poem called Mike Kadenia. He has orchestrated every stanza in there, knitting him together with a personality through life's experiences. He is his workmanship. A poem written by the Lord lived out in a person's life. Why are we created? The eternal question, why am I here? Why did the Lord save me? Answered in the next line. So that we would be in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the reason, reason why you're here. Good works. To do something. To make a difference in the community. To make a difference in the lives of your friends and family. Some of us have dramatic stories where we came to know the Lord out of crazy circumstances in our life. Some of us were heading to the road to ruin. Many of us heading to hell in a handbasket. Anybody know anybody that was heading that way and then was dramatically changed by the Lord? Yeah, there's some great examples that we have. But in Christ Jesus, we are created for good works, things that we are to do. And it says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the concept of a divine appointment. God has appointed you to run into somebody outside the Dollar General later on and talk to them about the Lord and his work in your life. Maybe it's a family member or a friend that for some reason brings up a question that immediately flashes in your mind, this needs a spiritual answer for this. Maybe it's just somebody on the street that needs some help. They need some food. And you go provide it for them and you say, it didn't come from me, this came from the Lord. I want you to pray a prayer of thankfulness to the Lord because he's the one who told me to give you this food or to help you or to carry somebody from one place to another or to take somebody to a hospital to get them, to get them you know, health care when they need. All those wonderful things are laid in front of us. And through a life lived, you see a litany of these things pieced together. I remember when the Lord asked me to help this person. I remember when the Lord asked me to help that young girl or that young gentleman. And it's a poetic weaving of life experiences. It's just amazing to see. At the end, when you leave this earth and you go to heaven, and the Lord just presses play. And you remember all of these people that you forgot. The guy that you helped, the lady that you helped, the one that you mentioned, hey, Jesus is the answer for you today. You didn't think anything of it. And yet, he makes play happen and you see it all unfold. And it's poetry in motion. What a wonderful future to look for. That we should walk in them. We should do that. We should look for these events in our life. It's a church that works. That's the ideal church. It's also a church that loves others. A church that loves others. We have discussed this for a long period of time, you know, that, that love is something that we should be doing. Jesus told us to love one another as he loved us. An example kind of a love. Well, how do we see that play out in our life? If you just look at Jesus' life, Jesus loved people who were inside the church, and he loved people who were outside the church, right? You think about the people inside the church, Mary, Martha, Lazarus. You remember that story in John chapter 11, where the Lord is going to head over and see these guys? These guys were beloved family members for the Lord. Really, really loved spending time with them. And then Lazarus gets this disease, 
and he's dead. And the Lord waits until he's good and dead. He's like, yeah, I could run over there right now, but I'm waiting until he's good, dead, and in the grave because I'm going to go raise him up as an example to the Jews, but also to reflect the love that he had. Jesus had compassion for these guys. It says in verse 33, Therefore, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her also Weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. In the shortest verse of the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Because these guys were so despondent that they lost their loved one. He was emotionally moved by that. The Lord knew he was going to raise him just like that. But yet the Lord still could relate to them who didn't really understand that he was the resurrection and the life. That even though you die here on the earth, if you are in Christ, you will live again. You will never die with the Lord in your life. And he weeps and the Jews watch him and say, see how he loved him, but he was weeping because of the lostness of the people. He had compassion for the people because they were lost. Do we have that same compassion for the people because they are lost and don't understand where they are going? The church that's an ideal church does that. It loves deeply. How about outside the church? People who are outside the church. Those who are really hopelessly lost. John chapter 4, there's this little interchange where the Lord and the disciples go to Samaria and they run into a woman at the well. And the lady at the well is not necessarily a great example of Christian living, right? A bunch of husbands living with somebody who's not her husband. The people in the society saw her as an outcast. The whole people, all of Samaria was outcast. So you have an outcast of the outcast. You know you're really bad when you're the outcast of the outcast. When the people who are out of favor don't even want to have anything to do with you. And let the Lord spends time with her, listens to her. She's an angry lady. She is pretty much pointing her finger at the Lord saying, you people. Anybody ever said that to you about your relationship in the church? You Christians, you do. Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> you're not perfect. You think you're holier than thou. Angry. She was angry. The Lord of glory could have struck her dead in a heartbeat, right? I've had enough of this, babe. Gone. But he patiently listens to her. And eventually, she figures it out. The Lord saves her, rescues her, turns her into the greatest missionary to the Samaritan people we have on record. She says, I need to go tell people about this guy. And it says the whole town came out after the fact when she went and said something to them. She became a great missionary because the Lord invested in her. Have you ever dealt with an angry person? Angry about their circumstances in life, mad about their fate, about how God is obviously not there because my life is so horrible, etc. I've dealt with a lot of angry people. You don't go to prison ministry for a number of years and not deal with a lot of angry people in there. How do we deal with that? We should be patient, we should listen, we should help, we should assist. Because we, we should love as the Lord loved in that case. I don't care if you want to yell at me about your life experiences. I'll give you all the time you want to yell. I'll listen. And then I'll say, you know what? You don't have to be this way. You know, There's a love that can permeate your life if you're open to that. It's a church that loves others. That's the ideal church. It's also a church focused on Christ's return. Focused on Christ's return. He said, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he says, your steadfastness of hope. 
These guys were in a tough situation. They're a young, small fellowship in the midst of this major commercial town. They just had their pastor run out of town because other people didn't like him too much, and now they're on their own. The persecution that came to Paul that ran him out of town, you just think it just kind of dissipated when Paul left? No, they started turning on them. They turn it on the small church. The adversary says, I'm going to snuff out all that good stuff that's going on in the church. I'm going to make their life miserable. I'm going to be persecuting them. These guys dealt with that persecution. It says they, they had steadfastness of hope. They were immovable in their hope. They were not going to be defeated because they were taught by Paul that hope meant eternal life. That hope meant regardless of the life experiences and the things that happen to you on the earth, there's a future. There's a heaven. There's eternal life. There's life with the Lord. Whatever I deal with on the earth, I know my future is with, is with him. That's the way these guys were. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, indeed all who want to live in a godly way in Christ will be persecuted. It will happen. Sometimes you're persecuted where we don't even realize that we are. Other times it hits us right in the face. I don't know, everybody, ever, anybody ever felt persecuted by people because of their faith? Could be people inside the church who are not happy with you. Oh, you think you're all holier than thou and all that kind of stuff. It could be people on the outside. You guys, you Christians think you know it all. There's mild versions of persecuted. I have a friend that when they found out he was a Christian, they just fired him from his job. I'm sorry. We don't want your kind here. If you don't think that doesn't happen, then you may be missing it a little bit more. But these guys were focused on the Lord's return. They didn't care about what was going on to themselves personally because they realized the Lord in their life was the greatest treasure of all. That's what the ideal church does. It focuses on the Lord and his return for all circumstances. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, he said, Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice! And be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were be before you. It'll come. It may be subtle at first, and then it may be bold. I don't know if it'll cost you your job, but to these guys, it cost them their life. The ideal church. The third quality of the ideal church. A church where the people are chosen church where the people are chosen. He said in verse 4, knowing brethren beloved of God his choice of you. What does chosen mean? We can say chosen just means saved. There's a novel concept, right? Ideal church where the people inside are actually saved. I was mentioning Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 has this list of seven churches. Seven churches. Not some good examples. The Ephesian church, we call the loveless church. It's a church that lost its first love. It did a lot of good things, but the Lord's rebuke of the church was, you don't have a heart for me anymore. You've lost that. You started good, but somehow you lost it along the way. It became an educationally oriented church. They were all about learning and filling their heads with information, and they didn't live it out. They didn't love people in the Lord's name. It became an academic church. And then you have a church, Smyrna, which is we call the persecuted church. These guys were feeling it. They were dealing with lots of persecution. They bared up under it. The Lord doesn't have any rebuke for them at all. He says, you guys are faithful and true to the end. You're a great example of that. And then you have Pergamum. We call it the compromising church. The church that 
you know, part of the crew is doing things and living well, and the other crew part of the church is doing all sorts of stuff and living like they want to live without any care for the others. And you have this contra, you know, contradiction within the church, a very cliquish kind of thing. And the Lord says, you know, I'm going to throw the, the bad side of this church, you know, out. <laughs> I'm going to put them on a bed of torment. And then you have the church in Thyatira, the absolutely corrupt church. The leadership all the way down is corrupt. Very few good things in the church. Not a good example of a church. And then you have Sardis. <laughs> Sardis is a great church. The Lord says to Sardis, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. What did that look like in the modern times? You know, you got a marquee out there. First church of the life of Christ. That's on the marquee. But the church is dead on the inside. The name doesn't match the people on the inside. I'm hoping at Calvary Baptist, the people on the inside realized that Calvary was pretty important. <laughs> and that we revel in glory in the fact that Calvary is the reason that we can live. is because the Lord's sacrifice on Calvary. And then you have Philadelphia the middle of Revelation chapter 3. The church at Philadelphia was a church of brotherly love, caring for people. Very, very faithful. They really loved well. There's no rebuke of them. And then the last church is the Laodicean church. A church that made the Lord sick. The church where the Lord is on the outside, knocking, trying to get in. That's how bad this church was. There's no life in this church at all. There's no life in the people in this church. But the ideal church is the one is filled with chosen, saved people, where it's not just the sign out front like Sardis. There's real life inside, where it's not about living on past glory or a great start like Ephesus, but it's a church that never loses its first love. The love for the Lord and the love for the Lord extended to people is high. Where Jesus is not on the outside looking in like the Laodicean church, where people really love God and it shows up in the way that we live our lives like the church in Philadelphia truly saved people on the move for Jesus, loving as he called us to love. That's the beauty of this ideal church, and these guys were doing that as an example. The fourth thing, it's a church of action along with words. A church of action along with words. In verse 5, Paul writes, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example of to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. It's a church that's not words alone. Action along with words. The gospel did come with words. Paul preached with words. Paul will say later on, you know, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He told that to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians 9. His call was to preach. Paul preached. That's what he did. They got the words. But it wasn't the words alone. The gospel came with Holy Spirit power. There was visible transformation that was seen in the people who heard the word. It wasn't just filling your, filling your head with information and you walk out figuring like you had more knowledge. It was something that showed up. It was applied to their life. If Paul said, look, you need to live a certain way, they didn't let it go in one ear and out the other. They incorporated it in their life. People saw transformation in their 
life. Paul says, look, you saw the way I lived among you. I was your example. These guys are actually third generation examples. Paul said, you know what, I'm following Christ. You're following me. You're the third generation of, of this. Look at the examples that you have to follow. Paul proved it with his life. The church then became examples themselves. It's amazing to see this small church in the northern part of Greece had an example life that was known all throughout the continent. What would that analogy be for us here, that we could live a certain way that everybody in southwest Nebraska knew about our church? We were doing something that got notoriety across the state of Nebraska. This church was like that. Widespread notoriety because of their transformed lives that they were seeing. Paul told the Corinthians, be imitators of me just like I am also of Christ. Paul was rebuking the Corinthians. But these guys in Thessalonica were doing it. They were living out. They were living it out. They didn't need any more encouragement. In Acts 1, 8, Luke records, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even the remotest parts of the earth. That is a promise. When the Lord changes your life, you become a witness for him. That's not optional. It happens. You're either going to be a witness that people say, I want to be like that. Or you're going to be a witness that says, I don't want to be like that. He will put us on display. He told us to let our light so shine before men in such a way that they would see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Anybody feel like the Lord had lit them up as an example for a group? Anybody have a memory when they really felt the Lord highlighted them and spotlighted them to make a difference in somebody's life. Could be a kid that needs a home. Could be a, a kid in a school that was running into trouble, going the wrong way in life. Could be a friend that shares some information with you about decisions in their life that you think to yourself, that's not the way it should be. Maybe it's just somebody that you're called to pray for and never contact directly. He will light us up in ministry if we're part of his church. And he lit up the Thessalonian church <clears throat> powerfully, powerfully. The fifth thing, it's a church with an echo. Church with an echo. Well, what does that mean? Verse 8, he says, For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in also every place where your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. I can't think of a, of a more amazing discussion of this church than that from Paul. Here is the great pastor Paul who says, I don't need to tell you anything. Can you imagine a pastor saying, you've done it all great. <laughs> uh, you, don't, you, you don't need to do anything else. Just keep doing what you're doing, right? There's nothing else that you need to do except doing exactly what you're doing. That's what this church was like. Wow, what an amazing statement. Paul has no need to say anything. The man who wrote half of the New Testament <laughs> he has no need to say anything about this church. Why didn't he need to say anything? Because he says the word of the Lord sounded forth from you. The actual word in the original language is echo. Echo. It means to reverberate. That means on a Sunday morning when Paul was preaching, all of the information that he gave them on a Sunday morning, on Sunday afternoon, was getting echoed in the community. 
They found somebody to tell, hey, you know what I learned today? Hey, you know what we need to do? And so the message just didn't stop with the people in the pews. It went out, and it went out, and it went out, and it reverberated concentric circles of influence. You told this person, they told somebody else. The message just expanded with great amounts, just like the volume of an echo that happens, a gunshot that has reverberating echo across the whole you know, field and shot. That's the way these guys were like. So what do we say about the characteristics of the church? It's not focused solely on you know, getting knowledge and filling their head with information. It's taking that information and replicating that. And I'll say this, there are people that you know I will never be able to reach. I, ha I will have no ability to reach them. I don't, I don't have a relationship with them like you do. Yeah, you could bring them to church and you could say, let me introduce you to Pastor Jeffrey. He's from Detroit, but he's okay. You know, we'll deal with him. He's made it here two months. You know, he's all right. You know, even you do that, even though I have a conversation with him, I still may not be able to reach them because they have a relationship with you. So the messages that I pour into you as the Lord and the Holy Spirit leads me to pray for you and to be able to teach you, those messages need to get from you out to those people that I will never be able to reach. There's a reason why we put messages on the website, allows you to forward the links to people. You know what? This message, you need to hear this. Forward. Pretty easy to do. A little bit better if you actually tell the message to them. <laughs> you know, here's what I learned. Reverberate. You know, that. It shouldn't just be you filling into this commercial uh, consumerism kind of thing. You know, we shouldn't just be taking it in. It should be getting out. This church became a megaphone for the gospel. All the way down the continent, they heard about this Thessalonian church. What a great testimony of this church. In James 1, the apostle writes, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude them Selves. We need to do something with what we get. There are places in the world that would absolutely love to have what we have here, a place where somebody can come and learn the word of the Lord without being persecuted. They would love for that to happen. When we do mission trips as pastors overseas, it's not just an hour, you know. My buddy John MacArthur one time was talking about this. He went over to preach in Russia, and he said he preached his heart out for 90 minutes. And he was finished, and then there was prayer and stuff like that, and nobody was leaving. And the Russian pastor came up to him and said, John, these guys will be here for like six hours. You better have more stuff. <laughs> That's the passion that they had, because they don't get that so often and here we are able to have that and be able to have somebody to teach the word with that do something with that use it reverberate it teach people bring them into a place where they can understand what the word is and about and so I write in the notes if you're only hearing the word you're missing the point of church lastly it's a church repented and redeemed. A church repented and redeemed. Paul writes this, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, to wait for his Son from heaven who he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. The church is transformed with a testimony. What is your testimony about the Lord working in your life? If you were on an elevator and somebody said, Carol, how'd you get started with Jesus? What immediately comes out of your mouth? <laughs> what do you say? Elevator rides can be pretty short, right? 
Maybe there are only three floors. You have maybe five minutes. What do you say? Have you prepared something in your mind? You know, if somebody asked me about the Lord, here's what I would say. Or are you a type of person that will give this flowering sonnet of every, everything that happened in your life and how you came to know the Lord and how the Lord happened to that? You know, elevator rides end and quickly and you're in the middle of clearing your throat and then, oop, elevator ride's gone. <laughs> All right, have a nice day. <laughs> but I wanted to say, you know, what was your message be? You should try writing out what you would say. I actually have written out several things that I've said in the past as I've refined how I would communicate to somebody if I only had a few minutes. What would I say to them? And then I have a longer one. If somebody says, hey, Jeffrey, tell me how you got started with the Lord, like happened a year ago or so by a Catholic guy who was just trying to figure out what the Lord really meant for him in his life. How'd you get started with Jesus? I had a great conversation with him about that and it led to a long standing discipleship relationship to eventually him bowing his head and saying Lord I need you in my life <laughs> all because I had something prepared to say <laughs> at that point we need to have these things prepared this church had a testimony prepared Paul was hearing it from others Timothy and Silas came back and gave him a good report about that. He was hearing from people, hey, I heard what you did over there. I heard what, what effect you had on that Thessalonian church. He was getting pub from other individuals. But the church was made up of individual testimonies. And we all should have our individual testimony. Think about this. Some of the people in this church who've been around here for a long period of time, if you look at somebody, you know what, they've been a long period of time, I, I don't know how they came to Christ. Right? I have no idea. You know, I mean, Don's always been here. Right? I mean, what was his story? You know, you may not even know somebody else's testimony that you've been in the church with for 10 years or so. Ask the question, hey, Don, how did you come up, how did you get to your life with Christ? I'm just curious. Start the conversation like that. We should know each other's testimonies. We should understand those kind of things. Why is that important? Well, if you know somebody's testimony is deep addiction to drugs and eventually got to a point where his life was transformed and he's now with Christ and you run into somebody else who's dealing with addiction, you immediately can reference, hey, you know who you need to talk to? <laughs> this guy. Or if somebody had a major health challenge in their life where they thought they were going to die and then the Lord immediately healed them to a point and they've got a great testimony of healing if somebody is dealing with a cancer diagnosis. You know who you need to talk to? You need to talk to this individual. If somebody is just full of himself and full of pride, you know, living of his own rules, and just walking down a total path to hell on their own. And you know somebody who was in that same path. And then the Lord went, let me tell you who's boss. That was the Apostle Paul. right? Couldn't find a man more full of himself in Acts chapter 9 than the Apostle Paul. Until the Lord showed up, shined a light on his face and says, dude, you're persecuting me. You know what? I'm going to blind you. I'm going to take away all of your pride because you are on a mission to persecute. You've got to use your eyes to do that. And he put scales on his eyes. He took that proud man and turned him into a passionate pastor to be able to reach the Gentiles. This small Thessalonian church understood the truth, was committed to the truth. They lived by faith. So much so that they just long to be able to see the time when the Lord will come. I don't know that we actually understand that in the modern church. Maybe if persecution shows up a little bit more, we'll look to the Lord's return. How often do you think, the Lord's coming back soon? The Lord's going to come back and free me from this situation that I have or this craziness in the world. 
The Lord will put some order to a word, that, a world in front of our eyes that seems like a decay is everywhere. He will come back. People always ask me, you know, what's your hope for the future of the world, Jeffrey? You watch the world. You, you're a pretty knowledgeable guy. You watch what's going on in the news. You watch what's going on in Israel. What's your hope from the world? The world's going away. <laughs> My hope is on one thing and one thing only, right? My hope is built on nothing less than what? Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's the only hope for the world. He is the only answer for the world. These guys knew that. These guys taught that. The church was longing for Jesus' return to finally be free of sin, finally be free of persecution. And I put in the notes Romans chapter 7. If you've ever read Romans chapter 7 at the end where Paul is just absolutely busting himself, he's saying, I don't do what I want to do. <laughs> I do what I don't want to do. He says, I'm not living the life that I want. You know, I'm making so many mistakes. The great pastor, the great apostle Paul, totally opening up his heart, his kimono, and, and telling you exactly how he is feeling at that point. He realized sin in his life was affecting him. He wanted to be free from the sin. He called himself calloused meaning that he was broken and calloused over and broken again and calloused over. He was really ready for the Lord's return. And then out of that, that great Romans chapter 8, chapter that we love to read about all of our life in Christ, magnificently played out in front of us, came out of his wounding and understanding his life. So it is a church-repented and redeemed. So just to summarize, a church focused on prayer with a pastor focused on prayer. A church where faith, hope, and love is paramount. Where the people are chosen and living like they're chosen. A church of action along with words. A church with an echo where the church sounds out from inside its doors the messages it receives. And a church repented and redeemed. The church is transformed with a testimony. That's the ideal church. How do you think we're doing? If you had to review Calvary Baptist Church in 2020, 2021, how do you think the church would line up to the ideal church? Was it good? Do we have work to do? Do we have things we need to remember or remind ourselves and go forward with? There's a lot of work to do. And I think that we'll do the work. So I wanted to end. I put in the notes, Pastor Jeffrey's characteristic of an ideal church member. You know, it has to be, you know, it's a Baptist church, so we have to have feast in there, right? <laughs> it's got to have food involved. So let me give you those. These are actually the criteria that I use when I, I think about who could be in leadership of the church. This is, I actually use this stuff. So if a, you have a deacon or an elder or a trustee, or a leader of the Sunday school, or the women's ministry. You know, here's what I want to see in them. The F, faithful. I want them to be faithful. What does that mean? I want them to be faithful to the church. I want them to be part of the church. I want them to care for the church. When the church is open for business, they should be there and be part of the church. They should be faithful in the support of the church. The support of the church, you know, can be through monetary con contributions to the church, but also offering yourself up in service, taking a role, saying, I'll step up and do this. I may not be an expert at it, but I'm willing to serve. Are they faithful to the church? T, 
Two, the E, are they evangelistic? Do they understand the gospel? And can they communicate the gospel? Are they always marketing for the Lord? Are the messages of the gospel going out from them to other individuals? Because you want people who are leaders in your church to actually be on mission for the Lord. Are they evangelistic? Is that a priority in their life? Do I hear stories of, you know what, I was talking to Bill the other day and, you know, I was telling him about, you know, Jesus and what Jesus could do for him. I like hearing those stories when you guys give me information about how you're communicating out to others. So evangelistic. The A is available. You can have the most faithful person in the world who contributes a lot to your church, but if they're not available, kind of tough for them to be leadership in your church. They have to have a priority in their life, a balance in their life, where they balance family, <coughs> ministry, work, and providing for the household. You know, you, you got to have balance in their life. There's some people that are just not in a place in their life where they are in their life, where they're just not available because they just don't have the time in order to dedicate to the church. There are other things that are involved in their life. And we have to be able to say to that person, it's okay. <laughs> You'll serve when, when you can serve. But don't force yourself into this, you know, because you really don't have a whole lot of availability in your life. Now, if they're filling up their life with things that don't really matter, <laughs> then they do have availability. Their choice is just to choose to do other things. And there are a lot of people that fill up their lives with activities that they don't have to, right? But you want somebody in the ideal church to be available to be used. The S, sacrificial. You want people to be sacrificial. Sacrifice in the modern world is a little difficult to understand sometimes, right? But sacrificing is people that will remove their personal uh, expectations away from them and, and open up and give to others. The people who are saying, you know what, I really was going to go watch the ball game on Saturday afternoon, but you know, I, I, you know, I, so and so in the church needs me to help them clean their house or move. So they will sacrifice what they want to do for somebody else in the body or somebody else outside, you know, the body. You know, somebody is two blocks away and they're they're moving to a new house, you know, and we're just going to go help them out, and they will sacrifice what they have planned in order to be able to help somebody else and make a difference for the Lord. And then the last one, the T, teachable. You want people who are teachable. As much as I've studied the Bible over the years, I still hope I'm teachable. That is a mindset that says, you know what, I don't know it all, and there could be somebody else, a pastor or a friend, or somebody in, in a pew that says, you know what I learned? And I'm willing to consider that. And I listen. And I can be taught. I have, I have heard some great sermons from people in the pew. Right? And I have learned a lot through experience of just ministering to other people where I learn something from you guys. Heaven forbid, right? We're all in this together. You know, we're not all knowledgeable of everything right now. The Lord is going to open up experiences and information to you based on your life that I will not have a grasp for. And you will explain it to me. And it would just highlight more. Sometimes I get a question from you guys that drives me deep into study. You know, like an ask the pastor question. Man, I really like those because it drives me deep to understand. Yeah, I need to answer this. And then I learn from that. We want people who don't feel like, yeah, I've studied Acts. I know it all. I don't need to study Acts again. I'll wait until he goes to something else. <laughs> we want people who say, you know what? I'm going to learn something even though I've read it 15 times. Something else is going to be new to that. And they are teachable in that point. How are you with that? How many people say, I got all those things 
in feast. I don't know. We'll evaluate that over a period of time as we look to talk about filling new roles as we go through an annual meeting with that. I just pray that we all are faithful, evangelistic, available, sacrificial, and teachable because that's the membership of the ideal church. And when we live like that, we'll make a difference in the community, in our families, and our extended families because that's the way we are. So Lord, I just thank you so much for these words and this picture example of the ideal church. <laughs> what a great testimony it was for the Apostle Paul to see this. It shaped his ministry to other churches because of this faithful example. Lord, help us to be faithful, evangelistic, available to you, sacrificial to others, and teachable by you that we could be the ideal church here in this place. Lord, you can make us that way. And I pray that you do make us that way. I pray that you do set us on fire for you here in this community, that people will come and want to know why you guys are so different than that. Lord, show us the way and the path for each of us individually to walk, to make that happen here. And we will love to see it, and we will have great joy as we see it unfold for us in front of us. We love you. Hey, this is Dr. Jeffrey Plummer of Calvary Baptist Church in Cambridge. I want to thank you for listening to our sermon video today. I pray that your heart was blessed by listening to our message of the day, and I hope you'll stick around and look for more information on our website, which is cbccne.org. There you will find additional links to sermon video, as well as a blog that I write every week to our fellowship here at Calvary Baptist Church. Again, thank you for listening and watching our video today, and I pray that you have a blessed day.